It was the dog that didn't bark, at least not yet, as natural gas prices, a Chinese property collapse, and a U.S. debt default all reared their ugly heads and then went back to sleep. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, two former Treasury Secretary, Special Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers on this week's economic outlook. That's just not a combination that adds up to anything other than taking a big risk on uh, the inflation side. So I'm pretty concerned about where we are. And Steven Mnuchin on the fintech revolution he's investing in. I think the underlying technology of blockchain and using stable coins is something that's very interesting. Last week, it was all about property developer Evergrande, a situation that is far from resolved. But this week, we added to the list of worries a new name, Fantasia, when the high-end apartment developer failed to repay a $205 million bond when it came due, with investors like Lim Chow Cat of GIC sorting through the difference between pain and systemic risk. There will be some pain uh, you know, uh, inflicted on certain segment of that value chain, but it, we don't expect it to you know, come out to be a big systemic uh, problem. And natural gas prices, well, they continue to be a source of real concern, particularly when it comes to inflation, as they spiked up in the middle of the week and then came right back down after Russian President Vladimir Putin said that he might just open up the spigot. Here's France's finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, on the energy crisis. We don't want to be dependent on the supplies coming from foreign country. That's the key point. But in the end, the week really came down to just two things, resolution or at least postponement of the debt sink crisis. Here's what Senate leaders Chuck Schumer and Mitch McConnell had to say about the deal that they struck. We have reached agreement to extend the debt ceiling through early December, and it's our hope that we can get this done as soon as today. The pathway our Democratic colleagues have accepted will spare the American people any near-term crisis while definitively resolving the majority's excuse that they lacked time to address the debt limit through the 304 reconciliation process. Now there'll be no question, they'll have plenty of time. And the jobs numbers, which came in well below the headline forecast, but as usual, there was some nuance in the details. Here's Larry Summers. We got a lot of demand. We don't have so much supply. That's why the unemployment rate came down more than people expected. That's why the wage growth was much higher than uh, people expected. Despite those disappointing jobs numbers, a volatile week in equities showed a modest gain for the week overall, with the S&P 500 up a bit under 1 percent and the Dow up a bit more than 1 percent. But there was more action with the 10-year Treasury, as yields went up for the seventh straight week, ending up over 1.6 percent. To take us through the week and the longer-term prospects for investors, welcome now Stephen Ratner. He's chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors, which invests the personal and philanthropic assets of Michael Bloomberg. He's the founder and majority owner of our parent company. And Joanne and Feeney, partner in Advisors Capital Management. Joanne, let me start with you. As I said, there were a lot of little spooks this week. We were a little nervous about things. Are there real risks out there that just happen to go away for the time being, or were, did we overreact? You know, David, it's as if investors just woke up and realized that the stock market is a risky place. You know, you, you see COVID having surged for a while. You see a slowdown in economic growth because of all the shortages we're having. You know, people are now paying more attention to inflation and recognizing that interest rates will eventually have to move higher. And, you know, that, that has created a bit of volatility. It's volatility that, you know, if we were to think back, is actually pretty normal. Uh, and so, you know, yes, investors got a little bit nervous. We saw some volatility. We've seen, you know, growth, though, continuing to outperform as investors run to some of the uh, bigger cap stocks that appear to have a longer runway of secular growth ahead of them. So, Steve, what about you? You're a longer-term investor. As you sort through this, which are the, the false negatives and which are the ones that you're really worried about in the longer term? Let me, let me start with the ones that I worry about. The thing I worry most about is uh, inflation transmitting itself into higher interest rates, interest, higher interest rates being the enemy of the stock market and of investing in general. And that, to me, is the singular biggest risk. There are plenty of other risks, but 
I do think for the foreseeable future, we're on a positive growth, growth trajectory. There's still an enormous amount of uh, ex, we'll call it, you can call it excess or surplus or whatever you want to call it, money rattling around in the economy. Uh, the government transfers money that people didn't spend last year during the lockdown and so forth. And so I don't think there's any growth issue, but I do think there's a serious inflation interest rate risk out there. So, Joanne, let's pick up on that specifically. I talked to Steven Mnuchin, the former Treasury Secretary, this week, and he said he thinks the 10 years going to 3.5 percent, in part because he agrees with Steve. He's really concerned about inflation. Is the stock market ready for 3.5 percent on the 10-year yield? Well, we've already seen some pullbacks in some of those higher multiple stocks because investors are finally realizing that market interest rates right here are too low. Now, the Fed has made it clear they're going to begin to taper their purchases and they're going to hold away from raising short-term rates. But as they taper, the long-term rates are, start, are going to start to rise. And we should expect that to filter into higher multiple stocks. Those are the stocks that are going to see the biggest declines in their multiples. And that's why we advise our clients to make sure if you're going to own expensive stocks like that, make sure they have very good growth pro profiles, you know, which a lot of them do. But yeah, it's a risk. I think it's an asymmetric risk across the stock market because not all stocks trade at multiples that are vulnerable to rising interest rates, but some of them really are. And so investors really need to stay away from owning concentrated positions and all those stocks that did so well during the heart of the COVID crisis. So, so Steve, uh, the consensus seemed to be, in response to those very disappointing jobs numbers, that in fact it wasn't going to deter the Fed, which seems to be on track to start tapering perhaps November, the next meeting they have. At the same time, if the inflation really is worse than what the Fed is understanding, is there a danger they'll have to really react much more violently when it comes? Well, first, I think it's, I, I think it's risky to try to read too much into any month of jobs numbers. Uh, this month had a bunch of abnormalities in it relating to uh, people, teachers and uh, school employees going back to work in September and so on and so forth. Uh, the labor force participation number was very disappointing that people are actually still dropping out of the labor force, not coming back into the labor force. So all of that obviously does push you onto the slower side <coughs> of the economy. But on the other side, um, I do think, I don't think it's a question of when the Fed decides to taper. I think it's a question of when the bond market decides mm -hmm. that inflation is now the bigger concern rather than slower growth. And the Fed is going to end up perhaps in a reactive position rather than in a leading position on that issue. Joanne, if that is a risk, uh, taking into account all the other risks as well, what specific stocks do you, do you like at this point? Well, there, there are several to choose from depending on what you're trying to accomplish. We try to add a few different elements, secular growth stocks that can hold up against those inflation increases and interest rate increases. You know, for example, a company like Broadcom. It's into cloud computing. It's helping to supply parts for the iPhone. It has a software side of the business that are really going to keep margins elevated. Plus, it has a really nice dividend yield of around three-ish percent. So that's one where the multiple actually is pretty attractive and offers both, you know, appreciation potential because it's in such really, you know, set of really strong end markets. But it also has a really nice dividend. A lot of our clients really appreciate knowing they're going to get that income in their portfolios over time. You know, at the other end of the spectrum, a consumer stock like a TJ Maxx, which is really going to benefit as people do get more and more comfortable uh, going out to, to the actual brick and mortar stores. Uh, so those are a couple that we think, um, you know, bridge the gap between the technology world, the consumer world, and then for some insurance against those rising rates, some of the financials can often play that role. As rates go up, as spread, as uh, the curve steepens, those banks tend to do better over time. Steve, if I understood you, you were saying at the beginning, you're not so worried about the growth pattern as you are about possible inflation. But talk to me about China. Am I overly focused on Evergrande and the Chinese property market? Because I've seen some remarkable numbers about how much of Chinese growth is dependent upon that property market and therefore how much of global growth is because we depended so much on China over recent years. Well, you're certainly right to worry about Evergrande. The problem with China in general, Evergrande certainly being an example of it, is it, there's so much opacity in China that it's really hard to know what the facts are, what we should even be worrying about. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Chinese, I, look, I think everybody on the planet is aware of the Evergrande problem. I think the Chinese are certainly aware of it. I think they're trying mm -hmm. to manage their way through it. I would be cautiously optimistic that they will be able to manage their way through it. They have a lot of tools at their disposal. They don't have to deal with the Congress and so on and so forth. But, but it, is certainly, it is certainly a risk. But let me mention just one other risk quickly. Uh, which I meant to mention before, which is the risk to corporate profit margins. So yeah. I agree that, as, or as I said, growth is definitely happening out there. But the question is really whether companies are going to continue to be able to pass along the increasing costs of their raw materials and their other, and their other supplies. 
And that is an issue for corporate profits and then obviously for the stock market after that. So Joanne, why don't you wrap us up on that very point because we're about to go into earnings season again. Now, what about those profit margins? And it's not just raw materials, it's also employees. We saw in those jobs numbers, the, the wages are going up. Yeah, that's exactly right. But what we've seen so far is companies have been able to pass on those costs in the form of higher prices. We're hearing that from the consumer guys as well as the housing builders as well. So, you know, it's certainly a concern going forward. And I do think that this earnings season, we're going to get a mixture of responses on this. With some folks, you know, some companies saying they can pass these uh, uh, cost increases into prices. But more generally, right, these shortages that are driving up these costs are things that are actually going to extend the, the, the time period uh, for which that economic recovery will take place. That's actually a positive environment for equities, even though we do have in the background that interest rate increase, right? The longer it takes to recover, Right, the longer we have to ease those shortages to really boost uh, uh, sales for companies and boost their profits over time. And that's a pretty good environment for equity investing. And I, I think a lot of folks are getting distracted by this very misused term stagflation that I've been hearing. As an economist, I can tell you, this is not stagflation. <laughs> we have very solid GDP growth and we're gonna have growth running ahead of long-term norms for it looks like several years to come. A reassuring note to finish on. Thank you so much to Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management. Steve Ratner will be staying with us as we turn to the revolution in electric vehicles and whether it's going to turn out as good as the automakers hope. There's so much growth and there's a different margin profile for each of those businesses that I think is gonna to lead to improved profitability. That is next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. There's a revolution coming, we're told, in transportation as we go to electric and autonomous vehicles. And this week, we heard about GM's hopes and dreams from its CEO, Mary Barra, which were endorsed by engine number one CEO, Jennifer Grancio, in announcing a stake in the automaker. If you look at, you know, our internal combustion business, our EV business, um, the services are, are, are going to play a very material role. But then on top of that, there's also crews. And we think there's tremendous growth potential as we commercialize crews, uh, in addition to OnStar Insurance, Bright Drop, and our GM Defense operations. So that's why there's so much growth and there's a different margin profile for each of those businesses that I think is going to lead to improved profitability. This is a position for us where the company is making um, excellent decisions about how to understand impacts, change that's coming from a climate perspective, and is looking to scale a battery and electric business to actually take advantage of being a leader on the other side of the change. Steve Ratner of Willett Advisors knows a thing or two about the U.S. auto industry, having led President Obama's successful effort to bring it back from the brink of destruction. So uh, address this, Steve. I mean, you at one point in your career sort of took GM apart and put it back together again uh, in much better shape than people anticipated. But that was within the internal combustion engine world. Now they're going to have to convert over something else. How difficult is that going to be for this automaker? It's a huge challenge. There's no question about it to take a company that's more than 100 years old, reposition it for a whole new technology, go up against uh, challengers as, uh, as capable and as extraordinary as Tesla and come out the other side. I would say so far, the early signs are incredibly positive. I think Mary Barra has done an extraordinary job of changing the culture of GM, of getting ahead of the ball, of doing things like cruise, of making electrification the future. But now it's gonna all be about execution on her part, it's also going to be about the question of what consumers want, what they're willing to pay for, and how many electric cars they're really going to end up buying. Does she also have a much more willing UAW CIO than perhaps her predecessors did? It seems to be thus far, because I keep asking her and others this question, the UAW CIO is sort of on the, on the bandwagon here. Sure, because their jobs are at stake. Now, as you know, an electric car has many fewer parts, moving parts of, parts of all kinds, than an internal combustion engine car, and so there are questions about how many jobs there'll be. There are also bigger existential questions about how many cars consumers are going to buy of any kind. As we get into more ride sharing, you know, cars only used roughly 4% of the time. It's most families' second biggest capital asset. There ought to be a more efficient way to use cars, and therefore you may not be selling 17 million cars a year forever. But the UAW is smart to realize that it is better off getting on the program and trying to be part of the future 
than trying to turn the clock back on the pet to the past. And that's a lesson they've learned uh, in, in a harsh way over the years by how many jobs did get lost when they were fighting change. And Steve, I think that GM is the first to tell you there is a question about how big the pie in terms of number of vehicles is going to be in this new world. And that's why Mary Barra says, you know, don't think of us as a car company or a vehicle company. Think of us as a platform because we're going to make a lot of money off of the software services that get attached to that vehicle and beyond that. It's sort of like what Apple's done, you know, to say uh, to pay attention to the services, not just buying the phone. Uh, that's a big shift. Is it possible? Possible. You know, one of the things during the auto rescue, so we're now going back 12 years, that I found interesting was that we didn't get a lot of calls from people who wanted to buy General Motors or car factories or anything like that. We did get a bunch of calls from people who wanted to buy OnStar. And I sat there sort of scratching my head, well, why is this such a big deal? Well, now we know why it's such a big deal, that this is part of the future. And sure, they can do some of that. But I really don't. Uh, I would not stake my future or buy General Motors stock on the hope and promise that they're going to become a software company. It's a part of the puzzle, but it's not going to be the whole, the, all the pieces of the puzzle you need to put together to be successful. You mentioned Tesla, and of course there's some others as well, like Rivian, but Tesla's the big one that they have to try to overtake. There's also a little competitor in China. I mean, China really has been a driving force behind a lot of this electric vehicle movement. How does that affect GM or other U.S. and Western European automakers in their move forward? Uh, look, a good CEO worries about everything, and, and China is one of the things to worry about. But there is, there's not really a lot of evidence so far that the Chinese are going to successfully export cars to this country. Tesla, I would worry a lot more about Tesla. You know, uh, Tesla's got a $785 billion market cap. It's an extraordinary company, extraordinary CEO, extraordinary product. So th that, to me, is the, the imminent uh, threat, not, not yet the Chinese. Okay, you worked for President Obama in bailing out GM as well as Chrysler at the time. Uh, what about the role of the government? I mean, there is money, for example, put aside in the Build Back Better plan from President Biden for charging stations. Does a GM need some assistance from the government to make this work? Look, I, I would have, I have some concerns, and I know your special contributor, Larry Summers, has probably even greater concerns about the government delving into industrial policy, trying to pick winners, trying to start businesses like charging stations on its own. And, and so I do think the electric car industry in the U.S. in general needs some more incentives. I don't think, look, only I think 2% of the cars sold in this country at the moment are electric cars. It's a fraction of uh, what goes on in Europe and other places, Be, partly because we don't put a real price on gasoline, on carbon. So there's no real incentive. Until recently, oil prices were extraordinarily low. So I do think the government has a role to play in terms of using market-based incentives uh, to drive a movement, no pun intended, to drive a movement towards <laughs> electrification. But I don't really want to see the government going out building charging stations or anything else for that matter. Steve, right now we're doing a lot of talking about supply chains in this country. I wonder about supply chains when it comes to electric vehicles. I mean, when you were dealing with the auto industry, you had to make sure you had enough steel, enough rubber, things like that. Now we're talking about things like lithium and some rare earths and things like that. How difficult is it going to be to make sure if we're really going to go to all electric vehicles, we have enough of that stuff? Well, that is a place, this is now you're getting, definitely getting outside my area of expertise. We certainly in 2009, we're not talking about lithium, uh, but that's, that, that kind of stuff certainly is a place where government has a role to make sure that there is adequate access to supplies around the world and wherever we need to get this stuff. Uh, that, that's a bigger project than any one company can do. And that is something to worry about. But again, as we sit here today, that is not the challenge that the car companies are facing. The challenge they're facing is making this transition, building electric cars that people want to buy, competing with Tesla, and, and selling enough cars to continue to make good profits. So, so Steve, I just want to go back one more time to your experience. Are you sort of stunned by the fact that Mary Barra has enough capital to do this? Because when you went into GM, they didn't even know how much money they had, I don't think. And now she's investing billions and billions, I think something like $35 billion in this movement, and she seems to have the capital. I am... Um, I am somewhat stunned, happily stunned, at the success General Motors has had in general, not just in assembling capital, but uh, you know, she, uh, her, her success as a CEO is a little bit in contradiction to history of an inside, someone who's been in a company all her life, a company with a, that had had a dysfunctional culture taking over and doing as exceptional a job as she has done. It's, it is a bit contrary to corporate history for a company of that size and scale to pivot as quickly as it has pivoted. And I think what the reason she has access to that capital 
is because Wall Street has recognized the stock price. Uh, you know, it, it hasn't been Tesla, but it's done quite well. And so Wall Street has recognized her success, and the stock is now more than double than it, what, where it was when it went public. And so she has access to capital. Success breeds success in the capital markets. Yeah, and just very briefly, she also has changed the culture in that the not invented here was really prevalent at GM before. Oh, it was, it, 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 it defined the term not invented here. <laughs> I, I, could spend, I could spend a long time telling you GM stories of old GM, but nobody is yeah. happier than I am about yeah. the success of new GM. Come back and tell us those stories. I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much to Steve Ratner of Willett Advisors. We turn now to the loss of a Wall Street mainstay. Tobias Lefkowitz was Citigroup's longtime chief U.S. equity strategist and a thoughtful, often provocative analyst of the markets, one who frequently shared his thinking right here on Bloomberg. Tobias Lefkowitz died at the age of 60 as the result of a car accident. We will miss him. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. It's time now to get a sense of what lies in the week ahead on Global Wall Street. David, in Asia, we've got earnings and Ecodata next week that will provide more color on the impact of the energy crisis and supply chain disruptions, from China's inflation to chipmaker TSMC's report card. And with inflation in South Korea staying above the central bank's target for a sixth straight month, there are hawkish risks for the BOK to deliver a back-to-back -back rate hike. And with another week comes another Evergrande deadline. I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, the uh, saga continue to drag out, you know, for the months to come. You know, it's very difficult to see a solution right now, you know, which part of the investor base you want to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they don't have enough liquidity to pay, pay off all the liabilities. Well, the week is packed with economic data. First up, we have UK unemployment figures that should reaffirm a recovery from the COVID pandemic. And then we also get Euro area production numbers. We'll be watching closely for the effect of the chip crunch. The consumer price index for September will be released on Wednesday, followed by producer prices Thursday. Year-over-year -year inflation metrics remain above 5% for consumer goods while supply shortages, they continue to apply upward pressure on wholesale prices paid by companies. Those price pressures will be the focus this earnings season, which officially kicks off on Wednesday. Projected profit growth for the S&P 500 rose almost five percentage points during the quarter to 28.3%. That's according to data compiled by Bloomberg Intelligence. Fastenal, Delta Airlines, Walgreens, J.B. Hunt, and Domino's there will be some of the companies to monitor for commentary on whether wage inflation and supply chain issues eroded some of those anticipated profit gains. Also reporting next week are the big Wall Street banks, including J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman Sachs. The numbers are expected to show that while trading activity remains muted, investment bank divisions are benefiting from a continued surge in deals. I think this quarter is about two things. One showing that buybacks are accelerating, and two, showing that NII does have a forward path, does have an opportunity to go up as we look forward. Thanks to Sophie, Danny, and Romaine. Coming up, the investment opportunities in FinTech and the need for crypto regulation. From a new player in the space, former Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. They shouldn't be like casino chips. The actual money should go be held in a regulated bank, uh, in, in a trust account, and the people who hold the stable coins should be able to exchange those for real dollars at any time. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. FinTech, everybody's talking about it, even if we're not always sure what it is we're talking about. For some, it's all about cryptocurrencies with all the promise and all the uncertainty. Here's Don Fitzpatrick, Soros Fund Management CEO. There's 200 million, million users around the world. Um, so I think this has gone mainstream. For some, like Citadel CEO Ken Griffin, all that uncertainty keeps them from even touching crypto. We don't trade crypto because of the regulatory uncertainty. For others, it's not about cryptocurrency as such, 
but about a better way to transfer money and settle accounts. Here's Bank of America's Brian Moynihan and Aperture Investor's Peter Krause. One half of the money moved by consumers today at Bank of America today is moved digitally. One half. The more interesting aspect of cryptocurrency is not the fact that it is a speculative value, but that it's a mechanism by which you can actually trade, settle, and effectively record transactions immediately or instantaneously. That's the much more valuable part of crypto. And some see the move to digital currencies as a way to democratize all of finance, removing some of the costs and frictions that keep much of the world's population out of the system. There are many frictions in international uh, finance and domestic finance. Many people don't have easy access to digital payments. You know, in the US, you need a debit or credit card or a bank account to have access to digital payments. International payments are still beset by lots of impediments. They're expensive, they are uh, very time consuming. It's very difficult to track payments. So there is a real need for better digital payments. That was Cornell professor Ishwar Prasad. But however you regard the move to digital of our financial systems, the one thing that's for certain is that it is coming. And that as it comes, we will see regulation shape its future something SEC Chair Gary Gensler, investor Ken Griffin, and Senator Elizabeth Warren all agree is needed. Many of these tokens do meet the tests of uh, being an investment contract or a note or some other form of, of security that we bring them within the investor protection uh, remit of the SEC. Chairperson Gensler is spot on on the need to have thoughtful regulation around cryptocurrency. If people are gonna be out there trading in it, there needs to be a cop on the beat. President Biden may be putting that cop on that beat with an executive order regulating crypto. Former Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin's new fund is built to invest in payment systems, and he thinks some more regulation could just be a good thing. We're focused on areas that are, are critical to both national security and important transformative issues. So we're, we're most focused on technology with an emphasis on cybersecurity, national security, data privacy, and fintech and financials. So let's talk about fintech in particular, because there's a lot of talk about fintech. Uh, I think different people mean different things. When you talk about investing in fintech, where are the investment opportunities? Well, we really like the payment space. We think that's a gigantic opportunity, particularly for real-time cross-border currencies. I think the underlying technology of blockchain and using stable coins is something that's very interesting. But let me just comment because I, I saw a Bloomberg article this morning on one of the big stable coins. In, in my view, you know, one, some of these stable coins should most likely be regulated. And two, if they're backed by dollars, they should be freely transferable, and we should make sure that they're really backed by dollars, so that dollars are held by a custodian bank and that they're secure. Yeah, let's go exactly there. I'm glad you raised that, because there was a piece on Bloomberg today. It was about Tether, specifically, saying that right now they have 69 billion Tethers outstanding, and 48 billion of them were issued this year. Theoretically, that means they have $69 billion of more or less U.S. cash somewhere. Uh, how assured are we that they actually have that money? Well, I, I don't know much about Tether other than what I wrote about, and, and, and I thought the piece was actually quite interesting. But again, they shouldn't be like casino chips. They should be, in my opinion, if you're going to issue a stable coin, the actual money should go be held in a regulated bank, uh, in, in a trust account, and the people who hold the stable coins should be able to exchange those for real dollars at any time. So the stable coins should be invested in U.S. treasuries or things that look like U.S. treasuries, money markets of highly liquid backed investments. Stephen, it's not your job anymore. It was your job. Now it's Janet Yellen's job to figure out how you should best regulate that. She's had some meetings, as you know, to try to figure out regulation of things like stable coins. From your point of view, is that something that should be the Fed's responsibility? Is that the SEC? Where does that responsibility lie? Well, the Secretary of Treasury oversees a committee of all the different regulators. And th that's the right place. So the these issues cross different regulators. Some of them are Treasury regulations through FinCEN. Some of them are the OCC for banks. Some of them are the Fed and some of them are the SEC. And in general, 
Um, you know, I'm fine if people want to trade Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but I think there should be full transparency. These shouldn't be the equivalent of a Swiss numbered bank account. So if you're going to trade in these, they should be fully regulatory compliant, fully BSA compliant. And one of our big issues is to focus on cybersecurity. And again, one of the problems with ransomware is right now, it's way too easy to pay a $25 million ransom payment in, in Bitcoin. You know, you can't wire $25 million to people who you don't know, you can't deliver cash. Uh, I believe the regulation should be same on these other cryptocurrencies. So as you look to make investments with your fund in this area, how vulnerable are your investments to sort of regulatory changes? I mean, is that a risk, an opportunity, a little bit of both? Well, as I, as I like to say, I've been regulated when I ran a OCC bank and I've been a regulator. So I understand both sides. We actually like investing in companies in regulated entities because we think the, the legal and political risk is a lot less. And we think there's safety in, in a regulated institution, particularly whether a US institution, whether it's a regulated by the OCC or regulated by FinCEN or, or regulated by the SEC. So I, as an investor, would be very careful investing in unregulated entities. There are clearly places where it makes sense to do that, but one has to be aware of the regulatory risk. Mr. Secretary, do you have a sense of the possibility of contagion? Let me be specific. Let's go back to Tether for a moment, just because there was this piece just written today about it. Uh, there's a suggestion that perhaps if Tether collapsed, I'm not saying it will, but if it did, it could affect other cryptocurrencies. Is there a danger of contagion across cryptocurrencies? Well, let me just say, I'm, I'm less focused on the contagion. I'm more focused on there are people who are buying that thinking they're buying the equivalent of US dollars. So when you say you're buying into a stable coin backed by US dollars, there should really be US dollars there. So wh whether it's uh, an issue that drifts into other things or whether it's just in investors can't get their money back, I think that's a big problem and that's a regulatory concern. Uh, let's look forward if we can. In, in success with the payment systems really going into digital currencies, whatever we call them, uh, how does that work? What does that do to our current payment system, because our current payment system, both domestically and internationally, is a bit long in the tooth, I think it's fair to say. Well, let me just say, the Federal Reserve payment system for large transactions works extremely well. The smaller payment systems, to a large extent, still rely on, on ACH, which is an older technology and not necessarily as secure. And what, what I'm most focused on is what I call real-time payment systems cross borders, where we allow consumers to be able to transact peer-to-peer -peer across country in, in a very efficient way. People shouldn't have to pay five or 10% or 3% commissions for that matter, for transferring their funds. Th th these should be things that are done at 25 basis points or 50 basis points. And I, I think this is a, a great economic area and great for consumers. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, uh, well, there's one thing of moving from one payment system to another and the opportunities, disruption, but also opportunities in investment. Is it possible also that the overall size of the pie will grow? I mean, Ishwar Prasad, actually from Cornell, has written a book saying, you know, this is an opportunity to have more democratization of the financial system globally. Well, I think that's true, and particularly outside the U.S., it's it's even harder for people. I mean, in the U.S., there's still way too many people that don't have access to bank accounts, and that's even more of a concern as we go into the developing countries. So I, I think this is a global opportunity. Um, it, it is something that I think is a very attractive opportunity. Give us a sense about the global competition in the space. Uh, where is the United States in comparison to Europe and let's be specific China with respect to digital payment systems? Are we behind? Um, not, not necessarily. And let me just say this is this is a long issue. So, I mean, again, the payment systems work very well in the U.S. They can continue to work very well. I, I know there's been a discussion about a digital currency for the Fed. That's something that Chair Powell and I discussed. I think at this point, there's not a need for a digital currency from the Federal Reserve or the Treasury. I think the private markets can solve this. In the case of China, they have a digital RMB. I don't see that as a competition for the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And I think for the foreseeable future, given the safety and soundness of, of the dollar and the U.S. economic and political system, it's going to stay that way.
That was former U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. Coming up, we wind up the week as we do every week with our special Wall Street Week contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're going to conclude our week as we always do with our special contributor here on Wall Street Week. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, thank you so much for being back with us. Let's start with the jobs numbers. Came out on Friday this week. Disappointing by quite a margin, I must say, although some people thought underlying it, the numbers weren't as bad as maybe they appeared. David, look, I think this fit the story that we've been telling on this show almost exactly. We got a lot of demand. We don't have so much supply. That's why the unemployment rate came down more than people expected. That's why the wage growth was much higher than uh, people expected. We don't have a soft economy in terms of demand. We have more of a more damage to people's willingness to work than people expected a few months ago. The problem is that this points in favor of uh, the inflationary di diagnosis. Look, average hourly earnings this week, this month, rose at a 7.5% annual rate. That's not consistent with any reasonable theory of inflation. And with the unemployment rate lower and falling, it may even get the situation, may even get worse. So I think we're in a very uh, difficult uh, situation. Here's one way to think about it. We've got interest rates way below their neutral level. The Fed thinks the neutral level of interest rates like two and a quarter percent. They've got interest rates close to a half percent. They've got interest rates close to zero. And I think given the vast structural changes underway after COVID, we've probably got unemployment below the natural or neutral rate of unemployment. And that's just not a combination that adds up to anything other than taking a big risk on uh, the inflation side. So I'm pretty concerned about where we are. So I want to turn to a different subject, something you wrote on in the Washington Post at the end of the week. And it's this proposal, actually, as part of the Biden package, economic package, that the banks report to the IRS on the overall inflows and outflows, as I understand it, of deposits being held, basically as a way to get at some income that otherwise doesn't show up, for example, on your W-2 or your 1099. You wrote, and you were pretty forceful about it, I must say, in the Washington Post. Explain your point of view on this. David, I think this is really an easy one. Right now, if you or I have an account in a bank, the bank reports on that account by reporting interest. So we're already sharing that information with the government, and the IRS is already learning about our bank account. The proposal that's made is that, in addition to reporting on the interest they pay, they report on the inflow when the money comes in. And the reason for that report is that we've got an epidemic of tax non-payment in this country. On income that you get in a wage or a salary, on a W-2, compliance is above 99%. On income where you don't have information reporting, by businesses, it's below 50-50. And in total, the tax gap is going to cost us $7 trillion over the next 10 years. So the proposal is that when banks get substantial deposits, they have to report them. There's plenty of room for argument about exempting the little guy. There's plenty of room for argument about how, if it's a paycheck, it's already being reported on, so you shouldn't have to report it again. Those are details that can be worked out. But when the banking industry is saying that this is some kind of major invasion of people's privacy, this is something that's un impossible to do. I mean, these are people who are like incredibly proud of the fact that they're letting you buy a fraction of a stock on your cell phone in two and a half seconds. 
the idea that it's some kind of big burden to report a basic inflow to the IRS on an account where you already report is absurd. And, you know, I think the banking industry is right in some of the concerns it's had at some points about being demonized. But, God, you got to play it both ways. And this is a pretty elementary thing in the interests of the country. And I've really been pretty disgusted, I have to say, by what some of the bank trade associations have been doing in terms of uh, demagoguing this. It's not mostly the biggest financial institutions. It's the trade associations. And I guess their Washington representatives have to do things to get people excited to justify uh, their existence. But I've seen a lot that's not too appealing. And this is pretty close to a new low. So Larry, finally, give us a thought or two about the IMF World Bank meetings coming up next week, actually. Look forward to next week. What are the big issues that you think will, will be on the agenda? What should be on the agenda? We are sleepwalking towards doom on climate change. We are sleepwalking towards doom on pandemic preparation. And people are writing communiques about agreeing to cooperate and forming working groups and engaging in business as usual. It's not business as usual for viruses. It's not business as usual for forest fires. It's not business as uh, usual for rising sea levels. And it shouldn't be business as usual in terms of the global financial uh, response. What we are seeing is, in terms of its significance, the global equivalent of uh, the 9-11 attacks, much greater in terms of the number of people who uh, will uh, suffer. And what we are seeing is not a roaring mo mobilization, but a thin, pale bit of bureaucracy. One more I want to sneak in. That's the debt ceiling deal that was done this week, kicking the can down the road till December 3, frankly. We've talked about it a lot. You were concerned. We dodged that bullet. Are we in any better shape today than when we did, were before that deal was done? Yes, I think, we are. I, I think we are, David, because I think, first of all, we've averted a uh, catastrophe. Second of all, we're going to be able to work through whatever it is that's going to happen on the budget on a time frame that's different than the debt limit time frame. So we'll have more clarity. And I think that'll make it easier to deal with uh, the debt limit uh, in uh, December. So are we out of the woods? We're not out of the woods. But are we any longer in the center of the dark forest? No, I think we've moved towards the edge. Uh, Larry, yep. one of the big developments potentially this week had to do with that global minimum corporate tax. Ireland surprised, at least me, by saying, yes, we'll go along with it. And now we know, in fact, it will go forward. Tell us about the significance of that, potentially. David, I think this is the most important global economic agreement of the 21st century so far. It's important in reality because it's going to fortify tax collections from corporations for companies all over the world. It's important in principle because instead of countries running a race to the bottom with respect to taxing business income, they're now going to level up in a way that's going to be fairer and permit tax reductions on working people all over the world. And it's important in showing that Global economic diplomacy can be something that's not just about the people who are in Davos, but about working people uh, everywhere. Joe Biden's talked about a middle-class-based foreign policy. This is a huge triumph uh, for that. It's a great credit to the president who created the environment, to Secretary Yellen, who drove uh, the agreement, and to a large number of officials who've been working in this area for uh, many, many years. This is really a big uh, deal for international economic diplomacy. 
So we can end on a hopeful note. That's terrific. Thank you so much to Larry Summers of Harvard, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. Coming up, one more thought. Your tax haven may be closer than you think. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Call it the Mount Rushmore of tax havens. Taxes, none of us wants to pay them, but what's even worse is when you think you're paying yours and the other guy isn't, which is why it's red meat every time Democratic lawmakers point it out to constituents when they want to close loopholes. From Senator Amy Klobuchar of Minnesota. There are just too many people that have been using um, things that are maybe well meant in the tax code or many times not well meant um, and they use it to make a lot of money at the expense of other people. It's just not fair. To Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. Jeff Bezos is a billionaire grifter and so are the rest of these hugely wealthy people who pay next to nothing in taxes. And all the way up to President Biden himself. I'm not anti-corporate but it's about time they start paying their fair share. That wealthy people want to avoid paying taxes is nothing new, let's be honest. Here's President Obama back in 2009 pledging to close offshore tax loopholes. Now, for years, we've talked about stopping Americans from illegally hiding their money overseas and getting tough with the financial institutions that let them get away with it. Around the same time, U.S. prosecutors went after Swiss banks because they claimed bank secrecy laws were protecting some of their clients from paying the taxes they owed. UBS will hand over the names of American account holders suspected of tax evasion. Now other Swiss and European banks may be part of the government's crackdown on this practice. But now news comes of a new tax haven. Not the Cayman Islands, not the Channel Islands, not an island at all. No, it's good old South Dakota where the Washington Post reports that trust companies in the state have more than quadrupled their assets in the last 10 years, up to $360 billion. And a good part of that money comes from overseas. How are they doing it? The good old fashioned way. They are providing state laws protecting assets from creditors and from taxing authorities. This is all based on millions of documents obtained by the Post and the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And although the money deposited itself may not have come from any illegal activity, it did come from some pretty controversial figures, like the Colombian textile czar caught laundering international drug money or a wealthy Brazilian alleged to have colluded to underpay local farmers, or the family of the former head of a sugar company in the Dominican Republic accused of exploiting workers there. So before we get too high and mighty about how other countries are letting wealthy taxpayers get out of paying their taxes, maybe we should look closer to home, like in the shadow of Mount Rushmore.